In today's video, I'll show you how I bypassed SSRF protection using DNS or binding attack and got access to all users' files on the platform. If you don't know what's DNS rebinding, don't worry, I'll explain it later in the video. This was one of my findings back in 2020, which took me a full week to pull it off. Now let's jump into the lab and get started. Git clone the lab files from the GitHub repo in the description below and cd to the lab directory and run docker build t and give it any tag name and a period to refer to the current working directory, which has the docker file. After the build is complete, run docker run dash p 80 colon 80 to bind port 80 inside the container with port 80 on your host or change it to another port if you want to and then the image tag name once the container is up navigate to localhost on the port that you specify when i was enumerating the target live upon logging in i noticed an api call or a post request to slash api slash v3 slash users endpoint and it had one post parameter which is the user uid the target that I was testing was a file sharing platform, similar to Google Drive and Dropbox. Now when you send the post request, you get back all of your files. The very first thing that will come into your mind when you see a request like that is to test for idle vulnerability. And that's what I did. I created another account and copied its UUID and tried to retrieve the files in it. But that didn't work, because the user UUID was tied to the user session, so no idle there. Then I kept on enumerating the target for a couple of more days. There was a feature on this target that allows you to upload files using a URL. It's a neat feature but it opens the door for SRF attacks. I intercepted a request from this feature and started playing with it. Common things that you would try when testing for SRF is forging a request to localhost or any internal service to leak sensitive data. I tried to make a request to localhost but there was a SRF protection in place. Since this program was two years old, a feature like this was heavily tested many times for SRF attacks, but I didn't give up and kept on testing it. I then coded a Python script to try to bypass the SRF protection with a word list I use all the time when I'm testing for SRF. I really recommend you to use this word list whenever you're testing for SRF. I'll leave it in the GitHub repository along with the lab files. In this script, we import a request module for HTTP requests here we open the SRF by password list in read mode, then we define the URL for the upload endpoint. Then we start a while true loop. We read one line at a time from the word list and before we proceed, we check if this line is empty, which means end of file. And if so, we break the loop. After that, we define the post parameter, which is the file URL and set the payload as its value. Then we define the content type header to not get back 400 bad requests. Then we define our cookies so we can have our valid session. Then we make the request and we print the response to the screen. I ran the script, but I didn't get anything out of it. I then changed the API version to v2 and send a request and got back the same response. This was really weird because most of the time when I do something like that in any application, I get back 404 not found. That's because whenever developers push a new version of an API to production, they completely ditch support for the previous version. But there was some sort of misconfiguration here, and this is one of the things that opened the doors for critical bugs. Anyways, I modified the URL in the script and set it to v2 and ran the script again, but still got nothing. At this point I got really frustrated but I still didn't give up and start to fuzz the request headers. And after a couple of hours of frustration, I managed to get back a different response when I modified the content type header and set it to application JSON. The server returned request to localhost not allowed in the response. Here I know for sure that there was something wrong. I quickly modified my Python script again and set the content type header to application JSON and changed the post data to JSON data. And when I ran the script again, I still didn't get anything. At this point, I told myself, if I want to bypass this SRF protection, I need to get a little bit creative and think outside the box. Whenever I do black box pen testing or bug hunting, I use an extension called Wabalizer. This extension basically tells you what the application is built with. If this application was running on AWS or S3 bucket, Wabalizer would have figured out that for us. This is why I didn't test for anything except for localhost. And that's a neat proof that this application has its own infrastructure. 
If this application was running on AWS or a S3 bucket, I would have tried to forge a request to AWS internal or local IP address, which is 169.254, 169.254. Anyways, from Webalizer, I learned that there was a reverse proxy in place in this application, which means all the requests we send go through this reverse proxy first, then the reverse proxy forwards them to the backend server. Here, a voice in my head starts screaming, DNS rebinding, DNS rebinding. What made me think of this attack is that because I stumbled across a similar scenario in one of my pentest engagements. To understand what is DNS rebinding, let's first understand what's DNS. DNS stands for Domain Name System. Whenever you visit, for example, google.com in your browser, your computer or your router makes a DNS query to your closest DNS server. The DNS server returns the IP address that results to the google.com hostname. And after your browser receives this IP address, it will use it to navigate to google.com. Now say that we want to forge a HTTP request to a local host. If there was a reverse proxy or a proxy in place, it will first check what IP address this domain that you supplied resolves to. If it was 127.0.0.1, it will completely drop the request and won't forward it to the backend server. However, if the domain resolves to any IP that's not 127.0.0.1, the reverse proxy will forward it to the backend server. And this is the crucial part of the attack. Right before the backend server makes a request to this domain, the domain will rebind itself to 127.0.0.1, or localhost, and all of that thanks to the very low TTL. At this moment when the backend server makes a HTTP request to this domain, it will resolve to 127.0.0.1, which will fool the backend server to retrieve the internal files on the server. It's more of a race condition than SRF. Now, in order to pull this attack off, I used this DNS rebinding tool. The hostname generated from this page will resolve randomly to one of the addresses specified with a very low TTL. TTL stands for time to live, which is a mechanism used by your local DNS to cache all the IP addresses that resolve to the domains that you visited. When this TTL runs out, the cache will expire, and the next time you visit the domain that was cached, your computer will make a new DNS query to resolve the domain to its IP address. In our case here, the TTL for this hostname will be less than one second. I set the first IP address to 127.0.0.1, and the second one to an IP address of a VPS I have access to, but for this demonstration, I will use Google IP address. You might want to supply a live IP address, not just any random IP address that pops in your head. Now, when we do NS lookup for a couple of times on this host name, we'll find out that it sometimes resolves to Google IP address, and sometimes it resolves to 127.0.0.1. I copied that hostname and put it in perp suite and then I sent a request a couple of times and finally I was able to bypass the SRF protection and got access to the internal server. I could have reported the bug here but I didn't because I wanted to increase the impact. Now if you observe closely at the response, you will notice that it returned 404 not found. That's because the secret.txt file does not exist on the server. And that's when I thought of directory fuzzing or content brute forcing on the internal server. So I put together a Python script to fuzz for directories on the internal server. In a POC script, we import a requests module for HTTP requests and the threading module to create threads to speed up the fuzzing process. Then we open the common.txt word list in read mode and then we define the URL for the upload endpoint. Now, in the main function, we start by creating 15 threads. Each one of them will execute the fuzz internal endpoints function. In the fuzz internal endpoints function, we start a while true loop and reference the word list and the URL global variables. Then we read one line from the word list at a time, and then we check for end of file. And if so, we break the loop and kill the thread. And after that, we define the content type header and set it to application JSON. And then we define our cookies and we set the file URL parameter to the DNS rebinding tool hostname and append a current endpoint to it. 
Then we start a nested while true loop and send a request over and over again until we bypass the SSRF protection. We just want to make sure the request we send hits the internal server. So here we check the response status code. If it equals to 404 and the response body equals to resource not found, that means we hit the internal server, but the current endpoint returned 404 not found. And if the response status code equals to 200, that means the current endpoint from the word list was found on the internal server. So we print it to the screen along with the response status code. When I run this script slash API endpoint return 200 status code on the internal server. So I quickly return to burp suite and appended the slash API endpoint and send a request couple of times and it returned the whole API documentation. There were so many endpoints on the real target but I was too lazy to implement all of that in the lab. But one of the things that caught my attention was the slash users endpoint. When I send a request to this endpoint, it returned all registered users UUIDs. I didn't even stop here. Remember the request that was sent to retrieve the user's files using his UUID? Similar to that request, I added the user UUID as a get parameter and I was able to retrieve all the files that belongs to any user on this platform. After that, I took my time and wrote a report that explains every detail regarding the vulnerability and submitted it to the security team. The maximum payout for any critical vulnerability on this program was $1,500, but when the security team reviewed my report, they decided to reward me with $500 bonus because of how detailed the report was, and also because of how clever was this attack. This DNS rebinding attack can be possible in other situations. The existence of a reverse proxy or a proxy in the application is not a must for the attack to work. You might want to test for it anyway. We reached the end of the video here. Thanks a lot for watching guys. Make sure to like and subscribe so we can hit 1000 subscribers as soon as possible. It's a huge motivation for me to keep on creating content like this one. Make sure to share this video with your friends and whoever is interested. And see you in the next one. Peace.